Good morning, 1830 Generation. Glad to be with you guys once again, and we continue to kind of make our way toward that September 13th restart date for Sunday School. So I hope that you've been following along with us as we've been continuing to make our way through the Old Testament. And now we come to kind of the end of the period of the Judges, and we're going to move toward uh, really the Davidic Kingdom being established here over the next several weeks. But we hope that we'll be able to see you in person Hope we'll be able to see your faces and be able to interact with you physically here on September 13th. Uh, we are reopening Sunday School that day, and there have been a lot of Sunday Schools that have decided, hey, we just don't feel comfortable coming back quite yet and being in a small room like that. Um, but our class, the 1830 generation, uh, me and Mr. Allen, we're going to be here, and we're going to be here in person, and we're going to continue to push forward in our class here um, trusting that the Lord will protect us as we teach His Word and interact over His Word starting on that day. So be in prayer for that as that day continues to get closer and that the Lord would, um, just in His providential care, continue to protect our people here at First Baptist Covington and uh, pray for those who have been impacted by the virus and for school systems as they are really gearing up to get going. So we're going to be in First Samuel today. First Samuel. So let me give you a little bit of a recap of where we've been starting really at the beginning because we're shifting uh, a little bit in how God um, is interacting with his people. And as I already said, we're, we're beginning to look at how the Lord is going to establish a king for Israel. So we're moving out of the time of the judges and into a time where the kingdom of David will be established. So First Samuel really is kind of a especially the first few chapters, is really kind of an introduction, a prologue to when David, the son of Jesse, a shepherd boy, would be anointed and then installed as king. And everything in the first few chapters that we're going to be looking at today is going to be the prologue of really of David's anointing and kingship. But we started with Genesis and how everything in creation was created by the Lord, and He spoke things into existence. When our Lord speaks, He not only sets Himself apart from other gods of pagan nations and other gods of any other religion that there is, because if we study those ancient Near Eastern religions and we study other pagan religions, God, Yahweh, the Creator God of the Bible, is the only one that can speak. And He has spoken to His people in the Bible in His Word, and He has established that for us so that we can know Him directly through this special revelation. So He speaks, He creates all things, and including humanity, and then they fall from His grace by willingly disobeying Him and falling into sin. So we see this pattern of recurring brokenness through the time of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and even Joseph, but we see God building a people for himself. He's building a people for his own possession that he was going to set apart as distinct from the rest of the world. So when the rest of the world would look at his people, they would then know that they have a sovereign, caring God who is the only God for them. And so we see this, this people being built, and then they end up in slavery in Egypt, and in Egypt, then they are rescued by Moses, who the Lord used to lead them out of slavery in Egypt and into the wilderness where they would stay and wander for 40 years because they continued to sin and not trust in the Lord. And finally, under the leadership of Joshua, they would finally enter the promised land, this land that the Lord had said would be his people's, flowing with milk and honey. He gave it to them, finally. And so in Joshua, we see that that they conquer the land, that they move through the land and conquer it, but they kind of leave some remnants of pagan nations within the land. And we see that the Israelites, once they, once they settle within the land, they once again start a vicious cycle of disobeying the Lord, falling into sin, but Him continuing to show grace to them along with judgment, right? We did see the Lord's judgment on them at times. And so he needed people to be raised up from within the nation of Israel to guide and provide justice for the people of Israel. So he raised up judges, people like Gideon and Samson and Othniel and all these other judges that we looked at. And they would really lead Israel during this time. 
Well, the period of the judges is now kind of coming to a close. And a new era in redemptive history is coming. And instead of the judges, the people have been crying for one person, a king. Now, is this good or bad? Well, in some ways, we can see that the Israelites calling for a king, a humanly king to rule and to reign over them, is in some way a rejection of God who has done all of this for them in His grace. Because having a king over the nation of Israel means that they would look a lot more like the pagan nations instead of less like the pagan nations. A lot of the other pagan nations around Israel had their own kings that would rule their people. But the Lord, in His grace, decided, okay, I'll give you a king. And it may or may not look how you think it is going to look. But that is a precursor to the true king who will one day come back, Jesus, and how he will ultimately rule and reign justly and righteously over his people. And so we have this time period now, starting in 1 Samuel, where the Lord raises up kind of a judge slash prophet who would then go on to bring about the coming of a kingdom with a king here in Israel. So we'll be in 1 Samuel. So if you have your Bible, turn to 1 Samuel. Reminds you of our biblical framework that we have been walking through over really the last year now. And just a quick question to kind of get our minds going. What do people tend to run to when life seems to be out of control? What do people tend to run to when life seems to be kind of spiraling out of control? Maybe you've felt life spiral out of control. Maybe you have experienced that for yourself. But what do people tend to run to? Many times people do tend to run to God or at least their conception of who God is. That life is out of control. I need to get right with God so my life will then be back in control. And in some ways that's idolatry. In some ways that's not at all the way that we should approach God But nevertheless, people do run to God in times when their life seems to be out of control. And many times he uses that for that person's good, for that person's transformation, to bring that person to faith. What are some other things that people tend to run to when life is out of control? Well, it could be other religions. It could be friends. It could be family. Sometimes people, when life is out of control, they despair, though, don't they? They tend to continue to spiral down. They, find their, they try to find an escape, a release in drugs or alcohol. In today's culture, a lot of times we find our escape and our release in technology, binging Netflix or Hulu or playing video games for hours on end just to escape the reality that we find ourselves in. We try to create a new reality in maybe the digital world. What other things? Well... Maybe people just run away. Maybe they just say, I'm, I'm done with this. I'm, I'm tired of being out of control. I'm going to completely run away from all of my problems and try to start new, start afresh. These are often responses of people who have a life that is out of control. And we're going to look at someone called Hannah today in 1 Samuel. A woman called Hannah. Maybe you're familiar with Hannah. She's a great Old Testament woman of the faith the Lord uses mightily. So we're going to encounter her and we're going to see that she reaches her own breaking point where her life seems to be out of control. There's nothing that's going great for her. She is having everything kind of stacked against her. She's being persecuted by another woman. She's being pushed back against and and she's not really living the life that she really had probably envisioned for herself at one point in time. So we'll be in 1 Samuel chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 20 through 28 in chapter 1. So this is covering the birth of Samuel and starting in verse 20. Actually, let's start in verse 19. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord, and they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. 
This man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him, so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up under her, along with her three-year-old bull and ephah of flour and a skin of wine, and she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who is standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I may to him. Therefore I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And he worshiped there. So we, to kind of give you a little bit of backstory here with, with Hannah, before we kind of dive into these verses that we've looked at, Hannah was married to a man named Elkanah. And Elkanah had two wives. He had Hannah and he had this other woman. And this other woman was not barren like Hannah was. Hannah was unable to have children. Yet, this other woman was able to have children. But in these two wives that Elkanah really was not supposed to have, but the Lord was gracious and he had two wives, Hannah was loved more by Elkanah. Even though she could not bear children, even though she could not continue his line, even though she could not produce a son because she was barren, and this should remind you of other women that were barren in the Old Testament that we've looked at, Elkanah still loved her more, and he did not love this other woman a whole lot. So this other woman, in her spite and in, in her anger of not being loved quite as much, would really poke and prod at Hannah. In some ways, she would persecute Hannah because she knew that Hannah could not have children, and that she could. And she wanted the love of Elkanah to herself. But Elkanah loved Hannah more. And so finally, uh, they went and they went to Shiloh, a place where there was a, a temple, a sanctuary, a church, if you will, and they, they worshiped there, the three of them. And Hannah was so burdened by the way that she was being treated and the way that her life was out of control and the not being able to really do what she felt she had been called, called to do by God to bear sons. She went to the sanctuary with them and cried out to the Lord. And she pleaded with the Lord to give her a son. And she said that if he would indeed give her a son, that she would uh, give the son back to the Lord. And this son would really serve the Lord as long as he lived. And so the Lord heard her petition. The Lord heard her. And he did give her a son. And Samuel was born. And so we see that Point one, that a son is dedicated for God's service. And I hope as we move through this that you could see kind of the way that this story in 1 Samuel, these first few chapters, connects with Jesus, specifically in the Gospel of Luke. And how Hannah, specifically in some ways, mirrors that of the Virgin Mary. Both of them not having, uh, both of them, one of them really not being able to have children, but miraculously the Lord provides a child. And then the other one was a child provided for her, even though that she was a virgin. So these miraculous conceptions in some way, tying these women together. And we'll see as we move through this how these women are even more tightly uh, connected than even that. So when you think about Hannah and you think about her circumstances and how she was not able to bear children, how she was not able to do the thing that she really wanted to do, that she felt like she had been called by the Lord to do, and in the midst of really the poking and the prodding and the anger and the pushback from this other woman, uh, this other wife of Elkanah, what must have Hannah believed about God to pray to him under these circumstances? How must have how must Hannah have conceived of the Lord in these circumstances? Well, she had to at least think that the Lord hears prayers, at the very least, right? She cries out to the Lord, and she must have at least thought that He could hear her prayers, at the very minimum. And building on that, if the Lord can hear those prayers, she must have thought that the Lord could 
answer those prayers. That he had the power to do what no other human could do. That he could open her womb. That he could provide a son for her. Just as he had done for a couple other women that we've studied in Genesis, right? That the Lord who is sovereign over all, who in his providence continues to act in the world that he has created, that he is imminent here with us, that he is still 